know they want me to to talk about our uh, my life and uh, how aviation got involved. And it did begin, really and truly, uh, with the uh, with the uh, crop dusters. I'd go out and visit the family out in there, and I remember my mom telling me ages ago about having to come out to the barbed wire fence and forcing me to come in to dinner uh, or to go to bed when I was uh, four or five years old. Those crop dusters were fascinating. You could look up in the air once in a while and see a lone airplane flying straight line from here to there. Not terribly exciting, but those crop dusters were really exciting. They were doing basic maneuvers who later became part of an authorized or a, a, a aeronautic program that has been taught to men and women for years now that was done. A lot of these uh, maneuvers uh, that had been invented and, uh, and polished by crop dusters. Now, if you've ever seen a crop duster, in the, mostly in the Deep South, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Those guys are really good. They put those old airplanes into some impossible positions and recovered from them and uh, made money for the farmers, made money for themselves. Uh, early on, they had more than their share of accidents. But as they became more proficient, and this is true with any part of aviation, once you became more proficient with the particular maneuver that you're trying to do, uh, the safer it becomes. I experienced that myself, and I know most other people my age who who knew what was going on in aviation before World War II. Uh, the most uh, we had a few air races, and some of them were were not handled safely either. But gradually partly because of the, uh, of the uh, crop dusters and partly because of some of the associations that were formed by racers and, uh, and air show people, uh, which we know a lot about here because we, we see the air racers and we have uh, uh, association with officially and, and unofficially with people who are in the aeronautic business not acrobatics, or aeronautics, okay, and, and aerobatics. That's the proper way to, to uh, describe them. And uh, just very recently, we have another organization that people my age belong to called the UFOs. What's a UFO? It's not an unidentified flying object. No. It's a... Uh, United Flying Octogenarians, people who are over the age of 80 and still flying. And there are about 2,000 of us in the country now, I think. It changes. Well, you know, at our age, you're going to, it's, it's a changing situation. And we had a big meeting here just shortly with our local organization of the UFOs. And one of the speakers was one of the... Uh, uh, dominant women uh, acrobatic pilot, aerobatic pilots, and um, who was an executive here in Silicon Valley. And uh, I don't know, three or four years ago, something like that, uh, she decided that uh, she was going to take her money that she'd made, and this is her own words, she said made, she made a lot of money in Silicon Valley, and she decided she wanted to do something a little more exciting. And so she started taking uh, uh, flying lessons and then aerobatic license. And now she's one of the uh, primary uh, women aeronautic pilots in the whole world. And she uh, gave us a, a presentation on aerobatic flying, complete with uh, uh, real uh, 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 fancy would be the only way to put it. Uh, designations and drawings and descriptions of the exercises that you have to do in one of these contests. And of course, since I was a military pilot, 
you had to do a lot of those in military uh, flying because somehow or another there had to be a way uh, to get the better aerobatic pilots into fighter pilots schools and to get guys like me who were mediocre aerobatic pilots into uh, flying the big stuff because you don't do a lot of aerobatics in, in big airplanes. And that's true. That's exactly why they, they started these uh, exercises in these schools because if you're not a good aerobatic pilot, you don't want to be a fighter pilot because the other guy's probably pretty good. So, Bill, I, I'm going to interrupt just for a split second. You're doing so wonderfully, and it's just perfect. Too much? Uh, no, no. We want more. Even more is what we'd like. Even more, and do personalize it. I know you might be a little modest. I think most of you guys are. But we want to hear just about your day and, and how all of this played out for you. And, uh, but thank you for the background, and because and, uh, I know we're leading up to, uh, to more of your story. But um, uh, uh, thank you, Bill. Just thank you. That's all I can say. You're okay. doing fine. All right. Thanks for the guidance. <laughs> no, just, just but, so even more, just what you're doing, but just more about your personal life because, uh, man, oh, man, you lived it. And thank you. All right. All right. Uh, <laughs> Once I got um, past the uh, crop dusting stage, and uh, in 1940, uh, the job market picked up a lot. And even though my dad was a uh, uh, university trained uh, uh, pharmacist from the uh, it's now called uh, St. Louis University. I believe in those days it was Washington University in St. Louis. But uh, he had a bad episode during World War I. He was a pharmacist in, in, uh, in France uh, with the, after we got into the war. And due to an accident, he was gassed one day. They had a not many people know about this, and I'll just try to be very quickly about it. But there was a huge innovation in the treatment of uh, wounded uh, people in the battlefield. And the French, believe it or not, started it. And uh, it was called the uh, sanitary trains. And like I said, the French invented this, so they could call it whatever they wanted. But it was called the sanitary trains. And the war in France became very stationary, which enabled the sanitary trains to operate. And what they would do with the uh, trains would run out from Paris out into the battlefields, as near as they could get to the battlefields. And they would take these uh, uh, patients away from the aid stations. They had, maybe they'd been shot, maybe they'd been gassed, whatever. Put them all on board these trains, and ten, uh, attend to them medically as the trains went back to Paris to the hospitals. Um, believe it or not, you can look these things up on the, on the, if you want to get on the internet someday and and just uh, type in sanitary trains and see what comes up. It's fascinating what these people did. And when after the United States got into the war. Uh, our medical people started uh, uh, supplementing the medical people in France in getting these injured and wounded people back to back to Paris. And uh, my dad was accidentally gassed with some other people. And uh, so he became involved with the sanitary trains. And uh, he recovered substantially from the damage to his eyes, but he never really discovered from the... Uh, uh, damage to his lungs and uh, had a lot of trouble with that and he had to give it up because when he got back to the states uh, the uh, material in those days had to be compounded into little tablets or liquids and he developed allergies very severe allergies to these compounds and he just had to and if he wanted to live any longer, he had to give up the pharmaceutical business. And he, uh, at that time, was operating a drugstore in our hometown of Osceola. So anyway, uh, the Depression came in, in, the, uh, in the 30s, 
and it really didn't we really didn't start coming out of the depression and providing a lot of jobs for whoever wanted them until World War II came along. And uh, so, Bill, I'm going to stop real quick and do, tell us a little bit about that time in your life. This is really interesting to us. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Anyway, uh, we were still living in Osceola, and uh, my dad's medical condition got to be so bad that he sold his drugstore and uh, got out of the pharmaceutical business around 1926 or 27. And the only reason I knew about it, he never told me about this. The only reason I knew about it was because uh, my uncle, not his brother, but my mother's sister's husband, became my dad's best friend. And he told me about this uh, after my dad passed away. And he decided to take the money that he uh, got out of selling the, the, the drug business and uh, get into the, uh, uh, the business of repairing and certifying radios and uh, uh, refrigerators. They all became prominent and popular about the same time. And he really enjoyed that. But the Depression knocked the legs out from under that business. And um, I guess by the time uh, we got into the war in, in, uh, in uh, 1941, things were pretty desperate for our family. Uh, we were always, uh, you know, we got along okay because we had plenty of, of a family living in the outskirts of Osceola who were farmers. And uh, my grandpa was a fabulous uh, uh, gardener. And we had this huge garden out in the backyard. And so we had plenty to eat and we had, uh, and we had uh, clothes. My grandma was quite a, quite a seamstress. The only thing we didn't have was money. And it didn't take long for that uh, money that my dad got from the drug business to run out. And along comes the war. All of a sudden, after Pearl Harbor, our uh, country was obviously going to be in the, in the war in a big way. And underneath the topsoil in the state of Arkansas are huge deposits of bauxite. And Alcoa, the aluminum company, started mining this uh, bauxite that had previously been imported and was now impossible because of the shipping shortages. And they started digging an awful lot of bauxite out of the uh, soil in Arkansas. And they built this monster aluminum plant in Little Rock, which is the capital of Arkansas. And uh, my uncle, who had been so uh, informative about my dad's earlier life, got in touch with my dad and said, hey, you know, you're wasting your time there. You ought to see if we can't do something about getting you an interview because you're, you're now an electronic engineer. And so they did. And between the two of them, they got him a job at Alcoa in Little Rock. And we moved in 1940 from Osceola to Little Rock. 